From the food we eat, the air we breathe, the land we dwell, to the health of our body and mind, and the well-being of all things in the universe. Unlock the science with Chula Radio Plus. Welcome to Unlock the Science. I'm Virada Salim. From smooth ground level entrances without stairs to captioned videos and the use of high contrast colors in prints, these are some examples of universal design that allow many of us to have a better quality of life. In this episode, Unlock the Science would like to talk about the origin, history, principles, and some examples of universal design. A term that became known to the public in 1970s, according to the Dublin-based Center for Excellence in Universal Design, which was established by the National Disability Authority, the independent state body providing expert advice on disability policy and practice to the government and public sector in Ireland. Universal design is the design and composition of environment so that it can be assessed. Understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. The original concept of universal design was created by the late American architect, industrial designer, and the wheelchair user who suffers from polio, Ronald Mays. The New York Times published a story about Mays in 1998, saying that he was nine when he contracted polio. And had to use a wheelchair since then. When he was a student at North Carolina State University, he had to be carried up and down stairs to attend classes, and his wheelchair did not fit into the restrooms. In 1966, he graduated with a degree in architecture from the university's College of Design, and had devoted his life to devising environments suitable for all people, regardless of age or condition. Mays helped develop the United States' first accessible building code, adopted by North Carolina State in 1973, which served as a model for similar regulations in other states. His work also set a pattern for federal legislation in the United States in forbidding discrimination against people with physical impairments, such as the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988 and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Universal design was adopted in many Western countries in the later half of the 20th century, partly because of some factors that brought about major social changes with respect to civil and human rights, including changes in the design industry. One of the factors was war. Driven partly by the large number of Second World War soldiers returning home with disabling injuries, the rights and needs of people with disabilities received attention, resulting in government's responses with the introduction of equal rights and anti-discrimination legislation in the United States and Europe. These new laws introduced then aim to promote social inclusion and prevent discrimination and also put pressure on many sectors, including the design industry, to meet the demands of creating accessible and usable products, services, and environments. Moreover, according to the Center for Excellence in Universal Design, another major influence on development of universal design was a trend in design approaches at the time that focused on the needs of users from the very beginning of the designing process. It was a concept that looked at the physical anatomy and behavior of the person and used this information to create designs that fit. At the beginning, approaches of universal design were of particular interest for health and safety reasons. When we take a look at universal design in Asia, the country that has probably been most successful in promoting, even popularizing the concept, is Japan. The underlying idea behind Japan's success is that the need for inclusive design is not only limited to a number of people who have disabilities, but also a vast number of senior people, as the country is aging fast. Being the most super-aged country in the world, Japanese society is required to apply the concept of universal design 
to not only buildings and basic infrastructures, but also vehicles, public transportation, information technology, and other equipment used in daily life. The Accessible Building Law was enacted in Japan in 1994, in which it gives intensives such as tax reduction and accreditation for building providers who meet higher accessibility level requirements. Some competitive businesses, such as supermarkets, then made use of the law as a publicizing tool in trying to attract more customers to their newly opened stores. There have also been a lot of official design competitions that involved the general public, which helped popularize and familiarize Japanese people with the concept of universal design. Up next, I talk to Associate Professor Guntida Techa Warasinsakun, Head of Department of Industrial Design, Faculty of Architecture, Jalalungkorn University, who teaches a universal design class and has hands-on experiences in the Japanese practices from her study in Japan. She believes that this design approach can make people's life better. Could you help us understand more about universal design and also why is it important that we use this concept more in the society? For anyone who ever heard of uh, universal design, might already knew that the concept has been proposed and implemented in the design for quality of life for over two decades. Universal design uh, principle in brief It is about a summary of consideration factors that gain from the user aspect for the designer or policy maker to understand any disabled or elderly or anyone who wish to be able to live with uh, everyone in the society equally as defined by the name of the principle. Actually, uh, in uh, design school, for myself as we are now still t- teaching this uh, concept. It's about the guideline that may apply or may be applied as evaluation tool for existing designs or to be a guideline in the design process. It's about the characteristic of the uh, more usable products and livable environments. There's like an uh, example in, in Japan uh, they are so very uh, quick at software in, in this kind of design. They introduced the universal design food, actually because uh, Japan has already been the super age society, uh, the first uh, nation in, in, in Asia. So the problem about uh, choking or preparing food for elders has been a um, problem for them. Universal design food was proposed by the Food Industry Association to communicate with the people that uh, food for people can be uh, categorized and uh, the consumer can understand by the level. So uh, the UD is trying to accommodate a wide range of uh, people like individual preference or abilities regardless of the user's conditions. As a designer, to be able to to know the insight of different groups of users, what are the core elements or what are the questions, like important questions that designers need need to ask themselves and and figure out the the data in order to create inclusive design? It is important that First, uh, we should know the user or the stakeholder of the system. When we can scope down to the stakeholder of the system, then at that time we can define the multifaceted of the quality of life that people needed. So when, when we design, there are so many problems, but we have to focus first what is needed in the system. So there is no instant design solution that can be applied to any problem. Also, uh, you can see that in uh, our daily life, we have to deal with a lot of information. So at first, we have to define the, 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 the problem with the people associated with all the cycle of the situation. 
So I think that the information is the most critical part. Could you share with us the project uh, that you did for the blind? Like what inspired you to do that? And also maybe some important notes that you would like to share with the audience from that experience. It was the research, research and design project. It's the mobility aids variable de- device for obstacle warning for the blind. It uh, consists of two parts of device. The first is um, earphone that you can put uh, over your ears and uh, sensor and motor will detect and feedback the signal for the wearer. The other part of the product, we, we put it on a belt. We test this prototype with the Paralympic athletes. Their requirement uh, open our eyes that uh, not only the safety factor but also the emotional factors we should consider because as an athlete in the national level, they compare with the others from other countries. So they need this sportive appearance. They need it to be uh, much more um, like empower them. Well, because actually when we get information from the blind in the society, they would like not to be noticed because they're afraid to be attacked by people who understand that, okay, you got, don't have any ear, uh, eyesight, you can be manipulated or something. So they would like to make it something like an ordinary product. But for the athletes, they, they need it more sportive, more attractive. And this is very uh, interesting and very uh, challenging for us to, to design to meet with their um, expectations. When we say that universal design is about uh, equality or flexibles in use, uh, actually, it's just the starting point. And then design can be forged or can be uh, achieved for more than function to the satisfaction of user. Not only safety or security, but how to enjoy the design. How universal design allows everybody in the society to live better? Well, actually the universal design is not only about the product or service system or environment. Actually it's already uh, applied in the learning system. The important idea about the universal design, you can think it as a democratic design for every being it tends to be implemented to accommodate and empower our ages and genders in any situations. So the design is to provide a feature and function for people to take care of each other freely without any kind of favor. You don't have to feel that you'll do something favor, right? If the design is achieved to let us living together equally, we can see that if we can exercise our right to do uh, like making decision for our our living, I think that the the mindset about the universal design, accessible design or design for all may gradually change the landscape of um, or the scenario of our society. That is the conversation I had with Associate Professor Guntida Techa Warasin Sagun, Head of Department of Industrial Design, Faculty of Architecture, Jalalongkorn University. We will take a short break now. You are listening to Unlock the Science on Chula Radio Plus. In 1997, Ronald Mays, who introduced universal design to American society, led a working group of architects, product designers, engineers, and environmental design researchers to create the seven principles of this rather new concept of architecture then in helping guide the designing process. Let's hear a summary of the seven principles. Principle one, equitable use. The design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Principle two, flexibility in use. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. Principle three, simple and intuitive use. 
Use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. Principle four: perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. Principle five: tolerance for error. The design minimizes hazards and adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. Principle six: low physical effort. The design can be used efficiently and comfortably. And with a minimum of fatigue. Principle seven: size and space for approach and use. Appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of the user's body size, posture, or mobility. Like Associate Professor Guntida said, principles of universal design can be applied in many areas, including learning and classes. Back in 1990s, CAST. An American nonprofit education research and development organization pioneered what is known as universal design for learning by providing guidelines and collaborating with teachers and educators to make accessible materials for students, with the goal of making learning more inclusive. The guidelines developed by CAST are about providing multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. It is based on the concept that there is no one way that will be optimal for all learners in all contexts. The practice can be thought of as an extension of universal design into educational disciplines and discourses, in seeking to accommodate the widest spectrum of learners. To illustrate how universal design can be applied in learning. That is one meaningful example initiated and implemented by a graduate of master degree in art education from Faculty of Education, d u l a l u n g o n University. t i r a p a w a n p a n u m s u w a is currently an art teacher at n a k o n s a w a n Special Education Center. n a k o n s a w a n is a province about 240 kilometers north of Bangkok. t i r a p a w a n has developed art activities to create. Aesthetic experiences for children with low vision to complete blindness in primary schools. I talked to Jirapon about her project, inspiration, and tools she uses to allow visually impaired and blind pupils to appreciate and enjoy arts. Could you tell us about your project and what inspired you to invent tools for blind children to learn and enjoy arts? As an art teacher. I used to wonder how the blind learn art and make artwork. If I don't use my eyes, how can I make art? At first, I thought that eyesight was very important in any artistic process. That was the beginning of my interest in visual impaired students. I used to be a volunteer to help the art workshops at the Bangkok School for the Blind. After that. I research more about art education, art activities, and blind children. It made me found that art for the blind should not focus on product, but art teacher should emphasize on the process of developing their skills or develop their potential in life. Turning to my project, this project was research way to stimulate aesthetic experience of children with visual impairment and bring this concept to come up with art activity can stimulate aesthetic experience in the real context and synthesize Marta concept. Talking about the Marta arts um, that you say that you use in the project, could you tell us more about this concept and how it can be useful to kids with the vision impairment and blindness? Mata is a guideline that art teacher can bring to design art activities to stimulate aesthetic experience of children with visual impairment. Mata stands for four components as follow: M, multiple sensories; A, aesthetical teaching; T, tactile media; and A, assessment. Firstly, multiple sensories. In classroom, not every student has the same ability to see. Some student cannot see anything. Some student can see only light and shadow. Some student see blur vision. Art activity 
should decide with stimulate multiple sensory, whether residual vision, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching in one activity, not all senses are used. But the activities for the blind will focus mainly on touch and increase the use of other senses as well. Secondly, aesthetical teaching. Our teacher design activities for children to have fun, teaching the real thing or go to the real place if possible, because direct experience is important. In art process, the teacher explains the techniques, methods. And reputation of artists, then teacher will teach realist by touching the real things or comparing it with the real thing. Thirdly, take time media teacher focus on media that stimulate touching, smelling, and listening. There should be no more than ten equipments in total per activities to prevent confusion. All equipments must be harmless. And does not make children allergic. Lastly, assessment and assessment of the experience learned through questioning and observation, avoiding evaluation the quality of the adverts. And all of this together from the Mata concept, what are the tools that you have created for the blind children to learn arts? From Mata guideline. I decide for fun activities for low vision and visual impaired students: cave art, storytelling from leaf, drawing lines to express emotion, and creating Picasso-style portraits. All of art activities they can use for all kind of blindness in the same class. Cave art states students. About prehistoric art that cavemen do hand stencil on cave walls, I connect the decks together as a long cave. Student crawl under desk while they were crawling. I tell the story and turn on the prehistoric music. End of the cave, they found a large rough cave wallpaper. I explain cavemen use blood and. Green rock and tree bugs to create colors. Now we take the color from the bottle. After that, they did hand stencil on cave wall and told the story of the cave together. Next activity is storytelling from leaf. This activity is done in botanical garden. Low vision students with visually impaired students collect leaf, flower, and stick. Then they brought them to create a character and introduce own character to class. Finally, they put the character to make up fairy tale together. It's really cool. <laughs> it's really <laughs> cool, and actually, it's not only maybe it's not only for the blind. Um, from your experiences with kids uh, with vision impairment, what are inspiring stories or abilities you have discovered about them that we, that you would like to share? While I was doing research on this project, I had the opportunity to work as an art teacher at the Bangkok School for the Blind for one year. I have seen many amazing events or abilities of the blind society. First, I The ability to use other senses instead of vision, as we have heard a lot of a lot from somewhere, people who have lost some senses are replaced by other abilities. Some students are good at playing music. Some students are good listening or good memory. Talking about color, although some students are completely blind. Children are always talk about colors. What color is this shirt? What color phone are you using? Although some people have never seen the color before, but they have a concept of color that compare to feeling. Red represent blood, heat, and sun. Black represents darkness, date, and fear. In this episode. 
we want to talk about universal design that is not just infrastructure, right? But um, how universal design should be in everything that includes everyone. So as a person who is a teacher and also to design learning experiences for children, I would like to know from you that what do you think are the core elements in design thinking to make sure that kids with disabilities will be supported to reach their full potentials. The process to taste that the elementary children with visual impairment can reach their full potentials is implementation. Result indicated that children can have an aesthetic experience that is appropriate for their age. Children's aesthetic experience must be continuously encouraged. There are nothing a blind person can't do. In addition to visual activities, blind people have the ability to live only by needing the suitable tools. Associate Professor Kuntida shared with Unlock the Science that universal design concept was introduced in Thailand at least a decade ago. Although there have been some improvements that we can see, such as braille blocks on the streets and parking for people with wheelchairs, there is still plenty of room for Thailand to do more, not only in basic infrastructure and public transport, but also when it comes to other aspects of lives that serve our needs and allow us to live better. She also suggested that besides enactment of government legislation and welfare system, Another approach to encourage businesses to adopt universal design could be profit-driven strategies by showing to business owners that this practice could attract more inclusive, targeted consumers. When it comes to learning by children with disabilities, Tirapon said what is needed are equal opportunities for them to pursue their studies, which require adequate supports of both human and other resources. Unlock the Science would like to thank Associate Professor Kuntida Teichawarasin Sukun, Head of Department of Industrial Design, Faculty of Architecture, Chulalongkorn University, and Tiwrapon Panomsoy, an art teacher at Nakhon Sawan Special Education Center. I hope you enjoy our program. You can listen to Unlock the Science on Jula Radio Plus at FM 101.5 every Saturday from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. You can also listen and follow us on our website, curadio.jula.ac.th, and our Facebook page. Our show is also accessible as podcasts, including on Apple and Spotify. See you again next Saturday. Have a nice day. Unlock the Science is edited and produced by Sinfa Tunsorawood. <laughs> 